Okay, well, we're ready to get back to our study of the book of Luke. And we had started under the general heading of what we're calling just about the book. And uh, we had noticed, I think, last week the purposes of Luke in writing. And one of the things that always stands out to me to show the closeness and the carefulness of the author is chapter one, verse four. He said uh, that he wrote that thou mightest know the certainty concerning the things wherein thou wast instructed. If you think about it for a minute, that's really what any teacher of God's word ought to do. And if you're trying to inform anybody really on any subject, you ought to know what the subject is. And that's the reason we say all the time, you can't teach what you don't know. And then when you have the warnings of James, be not many masters or teachers, for we shall receive the greater condemnation. And here is a great emphasis to be sure of what you're teaching. Uh, we mentioned that he also was writing so that any spurious doctrines pertaining to the gospel would be refuted and any faulty accounts of the life of Christ could be exposed. He always was interested in presenting Christ as the Savior, not a Savior among other Saviors, but the Savior of the world, chapter 1910. In fact, if you might notice when you get to his uh, account of the parables, uh, note the emphasis of on salvation in his parables in chapter 15, chapter 15. And he was looking beyond the fellow who he was originally writing this to, Theophilus. He was writing to all Gentiles who were interested and honest enough to receive the truth. Think about it. And he had the idea of converting them to Christ. And he wishes to commend the Christianity to, I guess we can say the cultured class of Rome. And I'll tell you why. Of course, it would cover anybody. But uh, I say of Rome, of the Roman Empire. Uh, I, I'll mention that in just a moment when we look at, um, at Theophilus. When we look at to whom it was addressed, Theophilus means it's a compound word, Theos God, and Phileo, uh, lover of God. Some people, and you'll find some commentators saying this, they think, well, that means he's writing just in general to all those who love God, but that's not the way it's used. It's it's used as a as a proper name. The expression. This is why I say that he's writing to somebody in a high position who's known as Theophilus because he uses, you know, God doesn't just use words for the, because he's wanting to fill up space. He calls him most excellent Theophilus. That is the way in those days that they address people who held high office among the Romans. Uh, it would be the same as in Europe of saying your excellency or your majesty, this kind of thing. So this is the reason that when he says most excellent Theophilus, that it's considered that he was in a, a high position. This is not unusual because we've all, we, we see him recording Paul, as I said last week, uh, appearing as he does in Acts uh, before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. Jesus had told them not to give any thought to what they would say because they would be brought before kings and authorities and it would be supplied to them through what became the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, which the apostles had, what they would be able to say. And thus, uh, we see some of that when we see Paul defending himself before the three I mentioned. Good possibility that uh, this man is a friend of Luke, and we can assume that he had shown some interest in Christ. I don't think we do uh, 
any injustice to logic or the scriptures to say that there had to be some way that Luke expected this man to take an interest in what he was writing and would read it with that interest and, and with a critical mind. I mean, a critical mind, I mean one that would seriously take what was said to him and think about it and evaluate it. Uh, we just don't know other than by those terms and the fact that he wrote rather lengthy works, such as Luke and Acts. And they're both written to the same person. There is no way to come up with a specific date. It's not identified in the book. We can try to look at certain things available and get an idea. Uh, obviously, it was written before the book of Acts, because when you begin the book of Acts, it's a continuation, uh, or the second volume, if you want to call it that, of what he started in the book of Luke. And the record of Acts ends with Paul's two-year imprisonment in Rome, and we know roughly that that would be around A.D. 63. So Luke is being written sometime before then. A likely time would have been during, I say before then, before uh, Paul. In other words, this is not the second imprisonment that Paul would have been in at the time that he wrote the letters to Timothy. Because at that time, he knows that he's about ready to leave this world. And even tradition says that he was arrested a second time. So he probably wrote this somewhere around 56 or 58, somewhere in that area. Um, he would have had plenty of time to um, interview people, to do the careful work that he mentions that he did. If you see me slapping around here, it's after a mosquito that's trying to get me. Uh, anyway, we want to emphasize that he was a cautious and careful student when it came to documenting what he was doing. And uh, when we're trying to work with somebody with the idea of converting them, then that's what we want to do, as I said a moment ago. Uh, where did where was he when he wrote this? Well, he could have been in um, Caesarea during Paul's time there. Um, Paul, remember, was in prison there for quite some time, I think two years, before he ever began his journey to Rome. And Luke seems to have been with him at that time. I say seems to. If you read Acts chapter 21 and verse 17 and chapter 27, verse 1, 21, 17, and 27, 1, it seems to have Luke with him at that time. I wouldn't be dogmatic on it because it could have been that he was in Rome doing some of that because he was, um, he was with Paul in Rome because he was that companion. Remember what I believe was Farrar said that he was a companion of Paul and would not be separated from him. Uh, so be that as it may, it was somewhere around that time period. From as far as the name is concerned, from the earliest times, the book has borne the name of its author, sort of like the other books we study. Um, it's not something that you see in the text itself. The word gospel, as we said, meant good news. So this is him writing about the glad tidings of good news, the gospel. Uh, it is according to Luke, Luke's account of it. I still like to emphasize that though it is current and used for a long time among many members of the church, especially in our measure people, and once we define it, we know what it means, but still not speaking as the oracles of God, because when we talk about four Gospels, we all know we mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but that's, there's only one Gospel. There are four accounts of that Gospel. From uh, the study of it, that is not it, but both books, Luke and Acts, you can see how they're tied together. And so for a little bit, let's look at uh, some comparisons of the two accounts of uh, Jesus's 
final appearance and uh, his ascension. In Luke 24, 33 and 34, compared to Acts chapter 1, verse 3, Acts 1, 3, you have Jesus appearing to the apostles. Then again in Luke 24, verses 36 through 43, Acts 1, verse 32, not 2, but also, Jesus is proving his identity. And Luke 24, 49, in Acts 1 and verse 4, you see that Jesus charges his followers. Luke 24, verses 47 and 48, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, you see that the apostles were to be witnesses of Christ in Jerusalem. And then Luke 24, verses 51 through 54, and Acts chapter 1, verse 12, the apostles leave Jerusalem. You can almost see as Luke begins Acts that he goes back into the last few words of Luke to tie them together as he moves on writing to Theophilus. And we could very well think of Luke's account of the gospel as I said, I think earlier, as the first book in two-volume set. Let's keep in mind, too, that you had no way of preserving anything as permanently as it could be done then, save that it be written down. And it was either written down on the velum or parchment, or it was written on clay. And you couldn't get any better than that. Parchment, of course, is skin, or rather, Belum is made out of animal skins. The only reason things like parchments and other things have lasted is because of the dryness of the area. Of course, you can understand how clay would last being written on and possibly baked to preserve it. Looking at some more information about Luke, I think that I pointed out that he may have very well been preparing for himself, and maybe this had to do with others as defending uh, Christians. He may have been gathering this information, not just to use one time. You know, if a sermon is worth preaching once, it's worth preaching many times. And uh, we shouldn't think that once Luke wrote this, of course, it's part of the inspired New Testament. We know it's been read by millions of people, but we shouldn't think that a letter would be written like this and just simply be for the eyes of one person. And certainly these people knew that they were writing by inspiration. They understood that. Although Luke was not an apostle, as Mark was not an apostle, they had to write by inspiration because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And thus they would have been writing, having the gift of the prophetic office. Thus they received that gift through the laying on the apostles' hands, which would be the same gift used by the apostles as they wrote. Now, Paul knew very well, if you read his writings, that he was writing by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And when you look at Paul's statement to Timothy, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Well, who's speaking? The Spirit. What's he speaking? Words. And he's speaking expressly those words, which means plainly. Paul knew that. So I don't know what that would have, how that worked in a person to know that you're thinking these things and writing them down according to the vocabulary and knowledge that you have, but to know at the same time, God is guiding you in selection of the words that you use. If there was any particular feeling <laughs> on that line, I don't know what it would be. Uh, he does, I think I pointed this out last week, uh, show how harmless Christians are when they're living like the New Testament teaches, because there was all sorts of rumors about them going on. He taught how that they were to love their enemies and do them good, chapter 6, verse 35. He pointed out they were rendered to Caesar, the things that are Caesar's, chapter 20, verse 25. This certainly 
caught the attention of any Roman procurator or governor or deputy or any Roman official because there was a constant effort to bypass Roman authority without causing any big stir just so they get by with doing whatever it is they want to do. And all I invite you to look at to prove that is look at human nature today and what people do and how they flaunt the law. Seems like sometimes the law lets them get by with it. And remember, Pilate said, I think I pointed this out last week, that I find no fault in this man, chapter 23, verse 4. That would have been in the official documents of Jesus appearing before Pilate. And Herod didn't condemn him, chapter 23, 8 through 11. And even the Roman centurion uh, declared this is the son of God or a righteous man, chapter 23, verse 47. And when you, if you get that in mind in the book of Luke, when you get into the book of Acts, he doesn't change his approach. It's just like he brings more and more evidence to the front. And uh, that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, Paul would say, and I wonder how many times Luke heard this, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. And Luke would have been witness to Paul doing that uh, all along because that's the way you really preach and teach with the idea of reasoning. As Paul has said several times in the book of Acts, he reasoned from the scriptures. That's what proper preaching is. It's taking the facts, the truths, the evidence, the scriptures. It's the word as you preach the word, you reason with people from the word. So you have to present it in, in a rational approach. Uh, that's the reason when you look at some things that are called sermons or nothing, but uh, I guess you'd say emotional appeals to people. And that's all they are. If you, let me urge you to do this. When you read something or when you hear someone speak, and you do your best to listen to what he says, where he's going, and how he reasons. When he gets through with what he's done, then ask yourself the question, now what did, did that person just say to me? And sometimes you'll go away saying, I have no idea what he said. He sure did talk a lot, but it didn't mean much. But when it's presented properly, you don't have any problem like that when you read any book of the New Testament or the Bible. You know what they're doing. You understand the point they're trying to get across. And that's the way it should be in any of the teaching that we do. Um, it's interesting that um, Luke preserves some of the earliest hymns, and he does so by simply noticing the situation. In chapter 1, verses 28 through 33, the words of the angel Gabriel to Mary when uh, it was announced to her that she was selected to be the mother of God's son, Hail Mary. Uh, one of the songs is Ave Maria. Now, Catholics sing that most of the time, but nevertheless, the roots are in that terminology that the angel said to Mary, Hail Mary. Uh, in chapter 1, verses 46 through 55, my soul doth magnify the Lord. Uh, this has been known as the Song of Zacharias. Chapter 2, verse 14, the song of the angels would be this, glory to God in the highest. Now, you may hear songs, Gloria in excelsis. Well, that's just the Latin for glory to God in the highest. And then... Uh, Chapter 2, verses 29 through 32. Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace 
that's been known as the death song of Simeon, Nunce Dimitis. And it's interesting, those old songs find their roots in these sayings that come from Luke. And those songs have been around for quite a while. You also see Luke emphasizing the prayers of Jesus. Of 15, no less than 15 cases of our Lord praying, 11, 11 are found in Luke. Plus, Jesus is teaching on the subject of prayer. He also emphasizes, that is Luke does, the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of Christ. And he does that 17 times. Now, this is an interesting thing, and we can't go into it in detail, but I will spend a little time on it here. When Christ gave up the form of God, notice I didn't say he gave up being deity. That's an impossibility. But he gave up the form of deity. He took upon himself what? The form of a man. That is, he became a man, a human being, just as we are. But it's obvious that he divested himself of some things that he is the second person of the Godhead had simply on the basis that he was deity. Now, what is a mystery here? I mean, that which is unrevealed, and we might not be able to understand it if it was revealed, is how he, as a human being, did what he did. And then, because the Scripture says he knew what was in man, Yet he'd given up the form of deity, but he was deity in the flesh. He'd become human, tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Then it means that when the, script, when the scripture says that the Holy Spirit was given to him without measure, well, without measure, what does that mean? The Holy Spirit was at his disposal. So that tells me in some way or the other in Christ becoming a human, he divested himself, himself of some things in order to work as a man and do the work that the Savior had to do as a man that we couldn't do. Yet, working miracles and knowing what was in man, then he received that because he had the Spirit without measure. Uh, now, you begin maybe to ask me a number of questions I couldn't answer. But I have to try to reconcile those scriptures regarding those things, and that is interesting to, to understand what it meant for him to divest himself of the form of deity, but take upon himself the form of a man and overcome the temptations of sin as a man, yet he knew what was in man, and he could work miracles to prove he was from heaven, that he was the Son of God. And um, those particular things, he could know things. Evidently, it was supplied to him because he had the Spirit without measure since he had become a man. And we'll just let that go with that because <laughs> that can go on and on and on as you think about it. Luke pays special attention to the role of women I don't know whether you've noticed how many times he selects, or the Holy Spirit through him selected, domestic scenes in the life of Christ and then our Lord's ministry. But write yourself down a little note and notice how much Luke brings that out. Luke shows that Christ is the Savior of all people and not just the Jews. That'd be very important due to the fact that so many for so long a time thought that Christianity was just something that pertained to the Jews. But of course it wasn't. And Luke wanted people to understand that. If you look in chapter 9, 51 through 56, I won't try to list all these because they're found in 9 and chapter 10 and chapter 17. He talks about the Samaritans. I don't guess we'll ever understand 
just what kind of a hurdle Jews had to get over to take the gospel just as the Samaritans. Because all you've got to do is read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to see the attitude, bigoted, prejudiced attitude of the Jews against the Samaritans. Then he focuses on the Gentiles in chapter 4, 25 through 27. And then the Romans themselves in chapter 7 and verse 9. He mentions that the gospel was for the poor in chapter 7, verse 22. Chapter 16, 19 through 31. Chapter 6, verse 20. I think we in America need to realize that if we don't watch out, sometimes we make people think that Christianity is for the middle to upper middle class American. And uh, it's very easy to think that way because of our own association. But Jesus associated with everybody. The poor have the gospel preached unto them all the way. And so he was interested in letting everybody know, no matter your station in life, the gospel is for all. And, of course, in chapter 13, verse 29, 13, verse 29, he makes it clear that the gospel is for all men. You know, when we went to Russia, because people don't realize it, but even Western Russia is an Eastern country. They have roots in the East. They're not considered to be in the West. But here we were coming from America in the West and trying to teach those people. And one of the things we would try to say is that we're closer to the place on earth where Christianity started by being in Russia than we were when we were preaching the gospel in America, that it knows no bounds, that it is something that started among the Jews in the East. And that's always something to keep in mind. I'm afraid sometimes we don't watch out. We think the Church of Our Lord is an American institution, but it's not. He also wanted to refute what's called the docetists, where Luke refers to the human existence of Christ numerous times because there was a doctrine beginning to float around. Later on in the first century and into the second century, uh, it would come up even more than this, trying to say that uh, Christ didn't really have a fleshly body. And one view had him having a fleshly body, but at the cross before he died, he left the body. And that's, that's dealt with a little bit in Colossians. And it's also dealt with by John in 1 John. Um, that's why John talks about um, we have seen, we have handled. In other words, he was a human. It's the reason John gives new new view to John 1 verse 14, when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Uh, he deals with him before his birth in chapter 142. He mentions him as a baby in chapter 216. He mentions him as a young child, chapter 227, as a boy, chapter 2, verse 40, and then as an adult in chapter 3, verse 22. As I said before, every word in the scripture is there for a reason. And originally it was written to those people at that time, but it was written with the understanding that it would comprise part of the New Testament of Christ, the last for all ages. So it helps us to understand why some of these things were written as they were at that time, but yet they may not give us that same understanding if we don't understand what was going on at that time. So the truth that never changes of the gospel of Christ was given under given circumstances, situations, cultures, societies, language, and technologies. And when we seek to ascertain the authority of Christ for our life, which we must, Colossians 3.17, then we don't want to drag over anything that would be peculiar to their culture or to particular things that were going on then 
as the truth was originally revealed and applied to that almost 2,000 years ago. So the problem is, is that we must learn how to ascertain that authority, how the Bible authorizes, uh, and how we can uh, get to the truth and occupy only the truth without uh, mixing up things that pertain only to that time that has no bearing on the truth. Now, Luke contributes two uh, unique chapters to our knowledge of Christ's ministry. In chapter 6, verse 20, all the way through chapter 8, verse 3. When I say chapters, I don't mean chapters of the scriptures, but two unique parts of Christ's life or chapters of his life, 6, 20 through 8, verse 3. And chapter 9, verse 51, all the way through chapter 18, verse 14, two sections. These relate, these scriptures relate to the Judean ministry and the Perean ministry of Christ, two of them. And we won't try to read those now, but mark them down again. Chapter 6, verse 20 through chapter 8, verse 3. And then chapter 9, verse 51 through chapter 18, verse 14. The Judean and Perean ministries that he writes about. Uh, there are six miracles that are peculiar to Luke. One of them is in chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. And that is the uh, miraculous drought of fishes. Another one is chapter 7, verses 11 through 16. And that is the raising of the widow of Nain's son. And then chapter 13, verses 11 through 13, the healing of the woman with the spirit of infirmity. And in chapter 14, 1 through 6, uh, the healing of the man with leprosy. Chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, the record of the 10 lepers that Jesus healed. And the last one, chapter 22, verses 50 and 51, where you have Peter cutting off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, and you have the record of the restoration of Malchus's ear. You have 11 parables, 11, 11 parables that are peculiar to Luke's account of the gospel. The two debtors, chapter 7, 41 through 43. The good Samaritan, chapter 10, 25 through 37. The important Friend, chapter 11, verses 5 and 8. The barren fig tree, chapter 13, 6 through 9. The lost sheep, 13, 6 through 9. I'm sorry, chapter 15, 3 through 7. 15, 3 through 7. Then the lost piece of silver, same chapter, verses 8 through 10 and the prodigal son, same chapter 11 through 32. Now, let me camp on those three just for a moment. There's nothing wrong with preaching a sermon or teaching a lesson on any one of them. But if you'll read the whole thing through, you'll see that all three of them were meant to go together. The lost sheep, the lost piece of silver, and the prodigal son. The Lost sheep can know he's lost, but he doesn't know how to find his way home. But he knows he's lost. The lost piece of silver, very valuable, but it's an inanimate object. It's not a person. It doesn't know it's lost. It doesn't know when it's found. So there are people that fall in the category of being lost like the sheep, and there are people out there in the world, maybe more nowadays than ever has been, uh, like the piece of silver, but then there are those that are lost like the prodigal son. They know they're lost. They 
know what they need to do to be saved because they've been taught, but they're not living up to what they've been taught. They've forsaken it. I know over my time period as a, as a preacher, confronted several of those people in various places like the prodigal son. Then you have the parable of the unjust steward, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. And in that same chapter, of course, the rich man and Lazarus. Now, I hesitate to put that there as a parable. If you deal with Jehovah's Witnesses who do not believe that when you die that you continue to exist or are conscious, well, they may believe you continue to exist if you're Jehovah's Witness, but you're unconscious. They are what's called soul sleepers. And uh, they don't want to think that the rich man and Lazarus account is really the account of what happened to two real people who lived in past time and space or history. But there's no reason to believe that it wasn't Jesus giving the account of two actual people, one named Lazarus, one who was a rich man, and that the whole account is a historical account. Um, I always like the way Brother Woods did it. He says, uh, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Brother Woods would then say, was there? And you have to answer, there was. And there was a certain rich man. And then you ask the question, was there? And you have to answer, there was. Well, that's completely unlike the way a parable goes. Now, if it is a parable, it still teaches the truth that that account of the rich man and Lazarus was meant to teach, which is when you die, you die lost or you die saved, one or the other. So I'd rather think of it because of the way it's written and the way historians wrote it that time period, that it is the count of two men, one lost, one saved. There was a certain rich man. There was a certain man named Lazarus. Then you have uh, the unjust judge in chapter 18, 1 through 8. The Pharisee and the publican or the tax collector in chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. Have you noticed in reading um, Luke uh, that he likes to call Jesus Lord? Luke applies Lord to Jesus 14 times. Only one time in Mark and never in Matthew. Now, I understand that you have to have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get the complete picture Revelation intended us to have of the life of Christ, of the proofs necessary to prove Christ is the Son of God. But yet, it's interesting that each one of them had their own approach, guided by the Holy Spirit through their own vocabulary and situation to write down these truths. Luke's detailed listing of dates and rulers at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus makes, I think, a vivid point that Jesus was not just some sort of idealized figure, religious figure though it be, but, and this is very important, Jesus was a real historic person who could be located in a specific time and place. And that's very important to understand because if you get into the mythological gods or other mythology of the Egyptians or the Babylonians or whatever, they just simply do not compare to the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, or the ascension of Christ. Luke traces Christ's genealogy all the way back to Adam. And in doing so, he is indicating that um, Christ was a universal man and not then, as I said earlier, just to the Jews. He gives the account of the conception and birth of Jesus, 
But notice that he does so from Mary's point of view. Now, that's significant among the Jews because a, a woman's viewpoint of things didn't amount to anything among the Jews. She couldn't even testify in court. They wouldn't receive her testimony. It's also interesting that there at the beginning of his life that you have Luke writing from the perspective of Mary. Now, when Jesus was raised from the dead, who do you appear to first? Two women. That's interesting. They had to go back and tell the apostles. And yet, according to Jewish law, their testimony that Christ came from the dead wouldn't even be accepted, which is proof of the fact that the accounts of our Lord's resurrection and that he appeared to women first is inspired of God. Because anybody trying, according to the way humans think, without inspiration, maybe trying to deceive or pull the wool over somebody's eyes, no Jew would have started out with the woman testifying. Nobody would have believed her. But here at the beginning, Luke records things from Mary's perspective. And at the end of his time on earth, as, his res as he's resurrected, he appears to these women. He also traces the genealogy of Jesus through Mary's family. If you go into tradition, early tradition says Luke's record contained the substance of Paul's teaching. Well, I couldn't prove that, but after all, who was he with? And who did he hear preach? And who did he discuss things with? And who was he around all day long every day, so to speak? In Irenaeus' treatise called Against Heresies, here's what, what he said. Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. And the Tertullian, who wrote against Martian, again, it was a defense. These are so-called church fathers. For even Luke's form of the gospel, men usually ascribe to Paul. There's the papyrus roll containing Luke's account. Uh, I should say, if you roll one out, let's put it that way. When you read those things, you rolled up one end and the other end unrolled. It would have to be some 30 feet long in the way they wrote on those things. Well, we have come to a place that we can stop for tonight. We'll try to get back into things regarding this. So we may, we may next week look at some about the Herodian family, uh, which may, may help. We'll give, a, as we've done before, a summary of the gospel according to Luke. And then we'll look a little bit at Herod. So if you want an assignment, you might get your study Bible or a commentary or something that gives the genealogy of the Herodian family and do a reading between now and next Wednesday. But we'll stop here in our study of Luke and continue next week, the Lord willing, with the summary of the book. We're glad all of you could be here. I hope it was helpful. And you can fill in the gaps now as you read it word for word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Thank you. Any questions?